Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much to those who have joined us. Um, welcome to this special Zoom event um, hosted by the Socialist Workers Party. We're going to be discussing Biden, China and the new imperialism. It's really great to have uh, so many people here. It's a very warm and sunny day in London today. So thanks for those of you choosing to join us on Zoom while the weather's so nice. And really wherever you're tuning in from around the world, um, I hope you're really safe and well. Um, my name is Jessica Walsh. I'm a member of the Socialist Workers Party based in South London, and I will be chairing the session today. So before we get started with some fantastic speakers, I'm just gonna give a brief rundown of how the meeting is going to run. So we're joined by two really brilliant speakers uh, to discuss this topic. They'll speak for about 15 to 20 minutes each. Um, then we will have time for discussion. This event is participatory. So we really want to hear from you, uh, whether that's questions, comments, contributions. Um, and after we've heard from our speakers, we'll hope you'll, that you'll do that. You can do that by using the raise your hand feature in Zoom and, and you know, I'll be, I, I will call people in to speak. Just to let you know that we will enter aim this meeting by quarter past six. Um, after we hear some sum ups and responses to questions from our two speakers. So without further ado, let's get started. Our first speaker is Alex Klinikos. Alex Klinikos is an author of several books, including the revolutionary ideas of Karl Marx, and he is a leading member of the Socialist Workers Party in Britain. So um, Alex, do you want to take it away for 15 to 20 minutes? Thanks so much. Thanks, Jeff. Um, sorry, just starting the stopwatch to be as efficient as possible. I want to start by talking about imperialism in general. It's one of the key concepts in the revolutionary Marxist tr tradition. If you want to, want to understand uh, what it means, a good place to start is Lenin's famous pamphlet, imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. And that's very important because it tells us that imperialism represents a developed form of the capitalist system. Now, I want to emphasize the word system because there's a more traditional way of understanding imperialism, which simply sees it as one big powerful country dominating others. And in the contemporary world, usually, Imperialism, in this sense, is, dominate, is identified with the United States. Now, there's a partial truth in, in this. Uh, the United States is the most powerful capitalist state in the world, and it does dominate and indeed bully and oppress people all, all over the world. If we look, for example, at what's happening at Cuba, in Cuba at the minute, the crisis economic crisis that has developed there, the protests that are taking place, uh, and so on and so forth, a crucial factor in this is the way in which the US has sought to blockade and crush the Cuban revolution ever since it took place in 1958-59. So to quote one of its main representatives, Colin Powell, um, the US is the big bully on the block. But if you just stop there, then you can draw the conclusion, which is sometimes called campism, that the US is bad, states that resist the US are therefore good, and we should support the states that resist the US um, and see them as a kind of progressive force. Um, today, that leads to an, an identification with uh, China and, and with Russia. And as Baba's going to explain, it's a mistake to think of, of China in, in those sorts of terms. From a Marxist point of view, imperialism isn't just about big powers bullying smaller states, smaller countries, weaker countries. Um, imperialism is a system of domination, exploitation, and competition. And I want to emphasize for these purposes, competition. Um, imperialism is a system of powerful capitalist states competing to dominate the rest of the world. Capitalism develops, the, the world, creates an integrated world economy, but at the same time 
development within that economy is uneven. Their rich countries and their poor countries and the most powerful rich countries compete to dominate the, the, the rest. So it's very important to see that imperialism is uh, uh, involves a plurality, a number of different powerful capitalist states that compete with each other for global global domination. Indeed, uh, sometimes I've suggested we sh is that, that we should see imperialism historically as what happens when you get the fusion of economic competition and geopolitical competition. Economic competition are the rivalries um, between capitalist firms that is the great driving force of, of capitalism. Marx says that it's, it's competition that makes capitals, the individual units of the system, behave like capitals, accumulate, extract profit, uh, exploit, and so, so on and so forth. Geopolitical competition are the rivalries uh, among states, which are much older, which go back in some form or other to thousands of years. The struggles for territorial dominance between rival ruling classes. But at the end of the 19th century, these two forms of competition fuse, and that's what imperialism is. Because if capitalism develops to the point economically where um, to be profitable, you have to operate on a global scale and you need the protection and support, support of your state. But equally, for the state to be effective, it has to have a strong industrial capitalist base that can generate the taxes to pay for, in particular, the advanced weapon systems that modern states need to be militarily effective. And from this perspective, one can identify three phases in the history of imperialism. Sorry, this is a very brief positive history. There's what I call classical imperialism, which develops around 1870 and continues till 1945. And this is dominated by the rivalry, in particular between Britain, the center of the industrial, the first industrial revolution, the dominant capitalist economy of the, the 19th century, and two great rising capitalist powers, uh, namely the United States and Germany, who begin to invade uh, Britain's economic and geopolitical space and to overtake it as industrial powers. And one historian said, that Britain at the beginning of the 20th century fa faced a choice. Who should it fight? The United States and Germany. The two world wars show the choice that Britain made. Britain fought Germany, but it was too weak to defeat Germany, so it had to ally by the United States. The result were these two appalling world, world wars. And, um, sorry. These two appalling world world wars, um, huge destruction and loss of life, the Holocaust, all the horrors, particularly of the uh, of the Second Second World War. Out of that process, the U.S. is dominant. That then leads to a second phase, which is the the U.S. and its allies, the Western liberal capitalist bloc, um, competing with the Soviet uh, dominated state capitalist bloc two rival imperialist blocs dominating the whole of the world, forcing states to take one side in their rivalries. Again, going back to Cuba, it's an interesting example of that because you have the revolution in Cuba in 58, 59, which is a nationalist revolution, inevitably uh, directed against the US because the US dominated Cuba economically and politically before the revolution. The US imposed a blockade, they then seek to invade Cuba and overthrow the Castro government in 1961. When that fails, Castro turns to the support of the Soviet Union. That then leads to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is essentially about the nuclear weapons that the Soviet Union, we now know, absolutely loaded the island down, down with, nearly leads to the Third World War. It doesn't, but Cuba then has to lean on the United States, uh, sorry, the Soviet Union, and is integrated into the Soviet bloc and embraces many of the characteristics of state capitalist societies like, like the Soviet Union in order, to, in order to survive. 
Anyway, the outcome, this is a very potted history, is that the Soviet Union can't bear the burden of economic competition with the US and its allies because they're much richer and more technically advanced than the Soviet Union. So it collapses at the end of the 1990s, the 1980s. And then we have the present phase of imperialism, which is one where on the one hand, the US is trying to entrench and globalize its domination by exporting the kind of liberal capitalist model that it, it pioneered to the rest of the world. This is part of what's involved in neoliberalism, in, incidentally, but it's challenged. It's challenged because it's exactly in this period taking advantage in its own way of economic globalization, of the opening up of global capitalism, particularly after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, we have the emergence of China growing very rapidly economically till today. It's the world's biggest manufacturing and exporting economy, but crucially outside the US system of alliances, outside NATO, outside the other geopolitical blocks that and institutions that the US, US creates and with its own agenda, which in particular is to push the US out of Asia, out of what now tends to be called the Indo-Pacific region, and also aiming to transform China, not simply into an industrial capitalist economy, but one that isn't just a platform which provides cheap labor for northern multinationals to, to finish their goods, firms like Apple and so on and so forth, but to make the Chinese economy a high-tech economy. This is what President Xi Jinping calls Made in China 2025. This combination of geopolitical objectives, US out of the Indo-Pacific region, certainly out of the, the, or away from the Pacific coast, go back to Pearl Harbor, one Chinese amb uh, admiral told an American admiral one. Um, and at the same time, um, the uh, technological enhancement of the Chinese economy is very threatening to the US, not simply because the US Navy has dominated the Pacific since the end of the Second World War, but because the US's great technological competitive advantage these days is big tech. The big, um, the big IT corporations, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, Netflix, this is where the US's great competitive advantage lies there, and it's terrified of it having uh, it being being eroded. And so we have a situation which is a bit like Britain versus Germany and the US at the beginning of the 20th century, now in the early 21st, 21st century, in a situation where the US has been weakened by two things that have taken place in the last 20 years. First of all, the war on terrorism, the attempt to US, use US military power further to entrench US domination of the Middle East, key region source of energy to China, for example, to potential rivals to the US. That whole project fails with abject defeat, both in Iraq and now in Afghanistan, as is reflected you know, in this extraordinary thing, you know, the US create this enormous base at Bagram in Afghanistan, and then one night they've gone. They switch off the power and they go. They don't bother to tell their supposed allies in the Afghan government and army that they're, that they're going. That's defeat. That's defeat. It's not like the US ambassador being flown off the, uh, the Saigon embassy in 1975 in a helicopter. It's not quite as abject as that but that's defeat. So the US suffered this very serious defeat. And at the same time, the global financial crisis starting in the US has in certain ways undermined the prestige and trust in, in US leadership among other global capitalist, capitalist states. Now, this is, where, uh, this is where Biden comes in. And Biden is, Biden for a, uh, a notoriously boring politician, Biden as president has proved to be uh, slightly interesting, very interesting actually, because first of all, there are continuities with Trump. So the economic war against China continues. The, uh, the, um, the tariffs that Trump imposed 
on Chinese goods remain in place very, very largely. The tone towards China is more systematically hostile. With Trump, you know, everything was so over the place that you couldn't tell, you know, next week he might be bribed by, you know, some Chinese billionaire and would start, you know, being friendly towards, uh, towards China. But here we have a coherent policy of hostility to China. Secondly, uh, like Trump, uh, Biden uh, wants to get rid of the, what Trump called the forever wars, the wars in the Middle East and in Afghanistan, and it seems to be doing that in the case of Af Afghanistan. But he's combining these continuities with massive state uh, expenditure, um, financed initially largely by borrowing, uh, largely by essentially the um, U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve, the central bank, doing the equivalent, the 21st century equivalent of printing money, in order to enhance U.S. competitiveness and also to narrow the social and racial divisions in American society. Because the assault on the Capitol on the 6th of January this year, even though it was a, uh, it was a complete failure as a political intervention to try and reverse the election results and so on, and it's faded in lots of people's memories, it was like that combined with the Black Lives Revolt, uh, Black Lives Matter Revolt, was like seeing into the pit of an abyss. And suddenly, uh, for the American ruling class, they realized how polarized American society has become. If you see this new book that quotes the, the, um, the chair of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, the head of the U.S. military, saying that, um, you know, with Trump, it was, he feared a Reichstag moment. In other words, when Hitler burnt down the well, no, he didn't actually, but he took advantage of someone uh, burning down the Reichstag, the parliament building in Germany. Miller was terrified that, that, uh, that, uh, that Trump would do something similar to impose a dictatorship in the US. That's a sign of how worried they are. So Biden is trying to heal the internal divisions in American society. Um, but also to strengthen the competitiveness of American capitalism. And he's very clear, you know, this is another New Deal, all that kind of thing. But one of our main objectives is to, is to establish, to win the 21st century against the competition of autocratic China. So China is still as much in Biden's lines, as I said, more coherently than uh, as, as it was in, in the case of Trump. Biden is also trying to reunite the Western capitalist class. Of course, uh, one of the things that Trump did was greatly to polarize things. To, um, in, he was very hostile to the EU, he supported Brexit and so on. Biden is trying to heal those divisions and the proposal, which I, has now been uh, approved by the G20 leading economic powers to, crea uh, to create um, a global rate of corporate taxation is one step in that attempt to reunify because um, the, the US, going back to Obama, not just with Trump, has been in conflict with the EU because they want to tax uh, big American big tech. They want to impose digital taxes. The US governments have, for the reasons that I've explained, have sought to defend those firms against this, this threat. Uh, and a threatening retaliation against European governments, including the British government, incidentally, for imposing or threatening to impose taxes upon, um, upon US uh, big tech companies. But if there's a uniform corporate tax rate globally, then they can say to the Europeans, look, you can tax Facebook and so on that way. You don't need to impose special taxes. So they hope that way to brigade together the uh, Western ruling classes against China. And they're doing similar things, for example, with Japan um, to, and Australia, a number of other countries as part of, this, part of this process. I think it's difficult for them to succeed in that attempt because there are so many economic advantages to be gained by continuing 
to trade with and invest in China. So we see, for example, the biggest European power resisting, resisting that. But in any case, this is an extremely dangerous situation. Um, it goes along with arms buildups uh, every th throughout the world. It goes through increasing tensions in the South China Sea, where there are all sorts of territorial disputes, as is absurd. British super aircraft carrier, the Queen Elizabeth, who is steaming around the world, or whatever aircraft carriers do, these days do, in part with the plan of defying China in the South China, China Sea, what they would do if China picked up the challenge is an interesting, interesting question. Um, this, there's nothing, this doesn't mean that war or anything like that is inevitable, that we're going to have a repeat of August 1914, but this is a dangerous situation. And therefore we have to build an anti-imperialist movement, but, but one that goes beyond simply um, opposing what the US does, important that that, that, that that is, but also challenges the other imperialist powers like Russia in its backyard, like China in its, its backyard, but goes beyond that to challenge the entire system, the entire imperialist system that this, these rivalries and all the dangers they uh, uh, they produce have at their their roots because it's the system that is the danger to human human humankind. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, okay, so now we're going to hear from our next speaker, our second speaker. Um, our second speaker is Baba Aye. He's a member of the Socialist Workers League, which is the sister organization of the Socialist Workers Party based in Nigeria. It's also the convener for the Coalition for Revolution. So Baba is going to speak to us again for 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll have time for discussion. So, you know, get your questions and comments ready for, for after Baba speaks. So take it away, Baba. Thank you, James. Uh, well, I, I think it's, it's quite an interesting time to speak on this topic. Uh, just last month, you had um, the Chinese Communist Party marking its centenary, and uh, it's had um, the Chinese Revolution as a, an ongoing concern for some 70 uh, odd years. And uh, when I posted the announcement for this meeting on, uh, on a conference of Marxism WhatsApp group, I got a call from a, a very good friend and comrade uh, from a sister organization. How can you talk of uh, China being imperialist? It's socialist. And, you know, it came with arguments, I mean, similar to uh, those of uh, a well-respected economist, of course, Michael Roberts. I mean, the law of value is distorted by the state and all that. But uh, I think when, when we look at the facts from what imperialism is and which um, uh, Alex has uh, further put in perspective, flowing, I mean, from classical Marxism, uh, a, a number of things become clearer. Uh, some would, some say that, okay, well, uh, it became um, capitalist, there was a capitalist restoration in, in 78, but is it really so? And how do these all feed into the current context of China uh, and imperialism in the, in the 21st century? You see that it, it did not start with 78. Uh, and uh, when you look at it, even within a year of um, after the, the Chinese revolution, it had annexed uh, uh, Tibet and you saw uh, between then and 78, several um, things that made it clear that look, this was uh, a regime, uh, a, a state that was primarily interested in the defense of the interest of its bureaucratic uh, uh, class of rulers and uh, not, uh, not the working class, which is at the heart of uh, what uh, a, a socialist, um, a socialist uh, system would, uh, would defend. So you had a I mean, rapprochement with Nixon in 71, you had support for, for a number of nasty regimes like, like those of I mean, Emperor Haile Selassie, the Shah of Iran, you know, uh, Pakistan's General Zia, and uh, Mobutu Sese Seko, uh, who looted uh, the bulk of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo's uh, funds. And even though China gave support to Salvador Allende, after the coup, it was uh, one of the earlier 
um, support, support the gain support to, to the welcome the Pinochet coup uh, despite that. And all these points to that real politics, uh, just as with all other uh, capitalist states, uh, was and is what guides um, its, its domestic as much as its, its foreign policies. Now, yes, yeah, 78 was a turning point indeed. It marked, you could say, it, it was where the seeds of uh, what China is now uh, as a global power uh, was, was laid uh, with Deng Xiaoping, who incidentally had been an active member of the uh, Communist Party, the CCP, since 1923. So he was not some outsider, you know, coming in with something uh, heretic, so to speak, you know, with his policies of, you know, welcoming in uh, foreign uh, capital and going out in terms of exports uh, of, of, of Chinese goods, wanting to leverage on, on cheap labor uh, uh, in China uh, within the broader global economy. And so th th this was a point of departure. Uh, at that time in 78, yes, you had almost zero of um, private capital's contribution. And this is where the issue of, uh, you know, uh, form being put before content when uh, some saw or still see uh, uh, China as a state socialist in some form or the other, you know. So, and, but now private capital, uh, it represents some 60% of the GDP uh, and 90% of, of exports from China. But what people need to put in mind is that private capital and the party state in China they are bound together at the hip. And what is more, the Chinese Communist Party holds private capital on a leash, which it draws where and when it thinks that uh, um, private capital wants to uh, be overly independent. We have seen uh, examples of that, and the, a sharp one uh, was that uh, at the end of last year with uh, the owner of uh, uh, Alibaba, um, Jack Ma, who, who, who was complaining about extent of regulation. So uh, the, the fact is that this, the, 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 the increasing um, place of, of private uh, capital, including foreign uh, capital uh, that came with the welcoming, in, it does not, uh, it was not a qualitative shift, you know, uh, from um, the bureaucratic state capitalist character of, of China, uh, from the from the word go. Now, with the the because I mean geopolitics, the, the, as 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 Alex pointed out, I mean it's, it's a global system and different events fed into things. And you see, with the collapse of uh, the the Soviet uh, Empire in eighty nine, the so called end of history, and with China's uh, you know uh, processes of welcoming in deeply by nineteen ninety. To, uh, this process took a step forward and explicit export-oriented industrialization strategy you know, was developed uh, between then and 2003, which was also an important point in, in, in the unfolding of uh, uh, the, the supposedly Chinese socialism with, uh, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, uh, but which some have described as, uh, you know, uh, Chinese colonialism with uh, colonialism with Chinese characteristics in Africa, but it's it's not just in Africa as we'll see when we look at uh, this uh, much deeply. So in in 2003, then a major step was the signing uh, uh, of uh, the 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 U.S. in 1992, the signing of the U.S. Uh, China Memorandum of Understanding in the night to reduce trade protections and recognize you know intellectual property rights. This was quite important uh, for now having uh, you know, production of uh, phones, uh, for um, uh, uh, American, Apple, for example, in, in, in China, how it became, uh, you would say, the workshop of the world, you know, and, and with most of this uh, being done in, in special economic zones that we are I mean, established to drive this. And with this, you had, a, a massive influx of foreign direct investment uh, into China. Now, uh, the United States felt comfortable enough with this to, to uh, believe that integrating 
China formally uh, more into the rubric of um, the, 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 the governance of um, uh, global capitalism would uh, be to their collective interest and particularly American interest. Thus pushing for um, China's entry into the World Trade Organization, which, which then took place in, in 2001. Uh, so this, this was, you say, an incubation stage uh, uh, for teens. So with this process of, of opening up, exports jumped, you know, what, uh, as of, uh, from, from 10 billion in, in 1978 by, by 2008, uh, just before, I mean, the shit hit the fan with uh, Lehman's brothers and, and, the, and the, um, the long depression, it had jumped to some, 1.4 trillion dollars. So the, this, 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 this money is the, the because imperialism essentially is also you know pushing out money uh, amongst other things to, uh, uh, to to expand capital within as well as joining you know uh, uh, and which China has done quite very well of uh, raw materials from you know, uh, from countries in, 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 uh, from other countries. So. Part of the moving forward with China uh, in, in this regard, it, 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 it's not in the way that the, the, the USSR managed to do with setting up an East Bloc, and which is part of, you could say, a weakness uh, uh, in, in, its, in it as an imperial power at this point in time. But its entry into the, uh, joining the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, ASEAN, which which started as an anti-communist uh, bloc uh, in, in the period of the Cold War, uh, helped to deepen its influence in, in, this, in this region and, and its contribution to the recovery of the region from the, Afri the Asian uh, financial crisis of 97 uh, contributed to, uh, uh, to entrenching this, 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 this economic influence. The 2000, the, the, the current century, would, if we say the earlier we had looked at um, laying the foundations for it, expanding it, if we say uh, the, the 21st century, this period of the new imperialism as you know, uh, a system marked the coming of uh, China to, if you would say that uh, America uh, is the king on the, uh, among the, 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 in the pieces on the imperialist chessboard, uh, and China became the queen, you know, uh, and uh, steps towards that included, you know, in, in, in the year 2000, establishment of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, uh, and by uh, 2004, the China-Arab States Cooperation Forum, and then in 2009, uh, it, it co-founded the BRICS with Russia, India, uh, Brazil, and, uh, and South Africa, yeah. So, this helped facilitate the, the, the commodities boom at the beginning of the century. But some things were quite clear. I mean, despite um, like Brit solidarity, the so-called newly industrialized countries in the South, despite all this, even the South-South trade uh, between China and, and these countries, it had all the trappings of the same relations uh, with imperial powers uh, in the global north. You know, for example, uh, the, the exports, uh, uh, from, um, uh, exports from Brazil to, to China uh, between 2000 and 2015, 84% of these were primary products, while 97% of imports you know, uh, were from China to Brazil were manufactured goods. And, and this is despite, uh, I mean, the fact that Brazil is, is, is one of the, I mean, dependent democracy and uh, dependent development, and one of uh, the more advanced economies within that, that region. So uh, there was also that illusion that China would buoy the world, you know, and the commodity boom would continue even despite the financial crisis. I mean, that period I, 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 was, uh, I was running a program at the Institute of Economics, uh, in the University of Campinas in, uh, in, in Brazil. And my Kalechian professors were very sure that look, uh, because you see it was slow motion before it got to Brazil and all that. But 
it, it, it became clear that the, there was really, it, it was still a cul-de-sac and, and its, it's economy itself contracted. Uh, they will, will come back to this. But now, China and Africa, I mean, this is quite important and for, for, for us in a number of ways as part of the, of the broader picture. The value of uh, China and Africa trade in 2019 was uh, $192 billion. Uh, dollar. But on the average, over the last few decades, I mean, this century, it has been some 200 billion. Now, exports from Africa uh, increased from 5 billion in 2000 to a peak of 156 billion. That's exports from, from China to, to Africa in 2015. So this contributed to this myth of Africa rising, you know, uh, increasing GDP growth rate, and so on and so forth. And also, you had sharp increase in, in, in capital inflow from, uh, uh, from China as foreign uh, direct investment. You know, stock of Chinese FDI in Africa was 16 billion in 2011 by, uh, by 2018. I mean, it was, uh, it was 46 billion. Now, uh, this might not be so much when you look at it uh, at um, the amount of FDI from China to other developing countries, uh, economies in Asia and Oceania, for example, which was of 474 billion US dollars, and to the developed uh, world, which was 800 billion dollars. $800 but there are some important things to note here. One was, uh, it, it was more also of the momentum than the quantum, the, the leap forward you know uh, uh, uh of, of of this it was quite significant and also as a number of authors have pointed out the the predatory nature of those investments and uh, support for local dictators as well as how these we are used we are used to try incorporate um the the, the ruling class in africa and uh <laughs> and even trade unions. I, I give examples. You, the, the, the building of the African Union in Addis Ababa was a Chinese Greek gift. Um, well, not just Chinese and Greek, but you understand what I'm saying. So, and also the headquarters of the Organization of African Trade Union Unity, uh, in, which is called in the Kwame Kuma uh, complex, was also a gift from China. Now, some of, because, I mean, there's no free lunch even in Freetown. In the early, I think that was like 2007, 2008, the African Labor Researchers Network, we are working on um, a, a compendium on Chinese investments in Africa. The OAT, the Organization of African Trade Union Unity, put pressures on us to, 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 to step that aside. These are part of what will go with the funding and, you know, because imperialism at its heart is economic, but it is also, you know, about the, 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 the power projection, you know, it's, it's about, you know, all this, it's political, uh, while it's primarily economic. So these are, are important elements of how it has uh, uh, expanded. And the Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, uh, Xi Jinping described as a community uh, uh, of common destiny, as um, well, it, 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 it's some see it as probably something larger than the, uh, what the Marshall Plan was, but already it's running into a, a number of, of troubled uh, uh, waters, in, including cancellation of some of uh, the loans and complaints uh, about, uh, about inflation of, of this loan. So now, where are we and, and, uh, and how do we situate this within the, the within what is to be done? And let me put it that way. I think uh, first and foremost, it's the needs, and that's one of the reasons why I think this kind of discussion is important. The needs uh, to 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 underline the the capitalist nature and imperialist characteristics of of uh, of, of of China uh, in global politics uh, and economy, and 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 secondly. To, to point out, look, the, the thing is, is this, it, it's not because what you have had with state capitalism generally and, and the Stalinist ideology is the passing off of developmentalism as socialism. I mean, socialism is not, and this is in Africa and also in Latin America, you have seen a lot of less learned from China, uh, developmental states, the democratic developmental states, and all that hogwash. No. 
at the heart of what is to be done is to build you know uh, solid relations of, of working class within in china the, this is, is is an important aspect also of the development you have been having a fight back you know you have been having fight back uh despite uh, efforts at, at crushing this so it's it's important to to point out to to point out this and to build on it and part of that understanding the point is to change the world but interpretation is part of the process of that is that understanding as uh, uh alex likely spoke to the, the issue of imperialism as beyond just um the the states but seeing how those different states please max pointed out that i mean capitalists generally are warring brothers and and, and you, you see this even at the global level with, with, with the dynamics of, of imperialism, which forced co collaboration in some sense, but you have that competitive, that logic of competition as something that becomes a, a trigger uh, uh, not for, for different kinds of cold wars, tariff wars, and increasingly as, as things get sharper, the possibilities of, of hot war, uh, and because you also don't have internationally you are uh, nationally you have the state as the executive committee of uh, of of the capitalists trying to give some sense of governance this is it's more complex internationally the multilateral and increasingly multilateral institutions <clears throat> cannot play that same role adequately you know so 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 and and these are some of the um the context within which you you now have uh, such uh, possibilities so, uh, and to stress, the, the issue of property forms is not the point of departure. I mean, fascism, you know, you also was, you had the, the critical role of the state and all that, but the, but the global economy as a point of departure in analyzing, understanding, and seeing how we can fight to change the world. Thank you. <laughs>